Hello and welcome to the Book of Revelation Historicist View Extra. Today we are going to take a look at what the books Daniel, Matthew, and Revelation have in common. I have entitled this video The Books of a Feather because I believe they have very strong connections. Now I have more than alluded to the books of Daniel and Matthew during our Revelation study. I have even had requests to cover them in more detail. This will not be an attempt to dive deep, but rather to undergird our study of the book of Revelation, as well as hopefully clear up a little more confusion. Now it could be said that during the Olivet Discourse in the book of Matthew chapter 24, Yeshua brought the past, present, and future all together, albeit for a very brief moment in time. I want to begin with an overview of these books. I intend to show that the book of Daniel, while giving us an idea of all four Gentile kingdoms that are coming upon his people, Daniel only delivers the histories of the first three kingdoms, Babylon, Media Persia, and Grecia. It's not going to be until we get to the book of Revelation that we get the details of that fourth Gentile kingdom, the Roman Empire, and consequently, its reincarnation. Again, I intend to show that in Matthew, at least chapter 24, these two books are linked in several ways. Yeshua looks back in time to Daniel, which not only prophesies about the 70th week fulfilled by the death of our Lord, but Yeshua references this book when warning his disciples about the coming destruction of the temple. Next, Yeshua looks forward in time, giving his disciples a cursory overview of the day of the Lord that's been prophesied about in the book of Revelation. Now Daniel consists of 12 chapters, making it a fairly brief book. We're going to quickly look at these chapters with a special focus upon chapters 9 and 11. In the first six chapters, Daniel details his captivity in Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar as the head of gold. And these chapters really establish Daniel as an interpreter of dreams. This is essentially the history of that first Gentile kingdom, Babylon. Here we learn the details and the consequences of Nebuchadnezzar's proud yet malleable heart. Chapter 7 is where we get our first look at Daniel's own visions. Here we see his vision of the four beasts or those Gentile kingdoms. Also in this vision, Daniel sees the Ancient of Days, which is God the Father. He sees the fourth beast being destroyed and the Son of Man being given dominion over all things. He also sees that the saints of the Most High will prevail over this beast. And yet he wrestles with this vision so much so that he would hear more about this terrible fourth beast. In chapter 8, Daniel has his next vision, that of the ram and the he-goat. Now, Daniel himself gives us the interpretation of this chapter. We learn that the ram represents Media Persia and the he-goat represents Grisha. These are the next two kingdoms that will follow Babylon. No doubt Daniel is perplexed by these visions and he's left pondering the prophecies regarding his people. He actually tells us in the first uh, opening verses of the next chapter, that he understands the prophecy of Jeremiah concerning the 70 years that the people of Israel would serve the king of Babylon. And here he is in Babylon. He knows the 70 years must soon be over, and so he begins to pray in chapter 9 about the prophecy in Jeremiah. Now, two-thirds of that fervent prayer is spent in confession. It's only in the final part that we see him asking forgiveness for his people. And Gabriel comes with an answer, but not to the question that Daniel has posed. Is the 70 years in Babylon just about over? No, Gabriel brings another answer, another 70 type period, 70 Shabuas for Daniel's people. In other words, Daniel says, are we about to be set free from captivity in Babylon? And the answer is, well, just shortly, in 70 Shabuah, you'll actually be set free 
from the bondage of sin and death. Now would be a good time to go back and catch part two of this series called Get Daniel Right. It's about Daniel's 70 weeks. And if you haven't seen that, I detail the historicist view of those 70 Shabuah, especially highlighting the final Shabua or the final seven year period, which was fulfilled, according to the historicist view, by the Messiah himself, by his death in the middle of that last week, which confirmed the new covenant of the book of Jeremiah, and which was the cause of the cessation of the sacrifice and oblations. Now you'll remember in our Get Daniel Right video that the Futures view attributes this very phrase, this portion of the prophecy, to the Antichrist. So it's very important to get that correct. But the confusion uh, also comes about because in chapter 11 of this book, there is a very similar description of another quote-unquote player who takes away the offerings. And I believe you know, it's easy to confuse these two events as if they were actually one. One of the reasons I decided to make this video today was because in my last video, part 17, when two worlds collide, I really misspoke in the sense that I mentioned both of these events, the one of chapter nine and the one of chapter 11, in the same sentence without being clear that they were different events. And so really, I want to, I hope to untangle these events from the minds of my viewers, if that's possible. But for now, we're just going to go through the rest of the book of Daniel and, again, focus in on these chapters a little later on. Now, in chapter 10, an angel returns to Daniel, probably Gabriel, but it doesn't say, to give him the details of the next two kingdoms. Now, imagine, Daniel has asked a very simple question, and in return, he got more than he bargained for. That is surely perplexing. But the Lord knows that often our vision is very short-sighted. So this angel giving him now histories beyond that of Babylon, taking Daniel's people practically to the Messiah, right? The, the difference between freedom from Babylon and freedom, as I said before, from the bondage of sin and death. Daniel is understandably concerned. So this takes us to chapter 11, the other very confusing chapter, as I said. But clearly this is about the interpretation furthering uh, Daniel's understanding about his last vision between the he-goat and the ram. The angel lets him know that the Greek empire is going to fall apart with beginning with the rise of Alexander the Great, the notable horn. His kingdom will be divided at his death between his four generals. And then we get those histories of the kings of the north and the south, and this being, uh, in hindsight, the Seleucid and Ptolemaic dynasties. But in verse 21, this vile person arises in most Bible scholars agree this is Antiochus Epiphanes, the Greek ruler who takes away the daily sacrifice. He also sets up an image of Zeus in the temple and further desecrates that temple by slaughtering a pig on the altar. That occasions the Maccabean revolt, I believe described as those who know their God and who do exploits. We know that this occurred around 167 BC. So it is fair to say that Daniel is given the histories from the time that he lives in, the Babylonian kingdom, all the way up to just prior to Messiah's birth. Remember, I had said early on that I believed all of the prophets were seeing the same vision, the Gentile kingdoms that were going to rule over Israel. Really, only Daniel was given a glimpse of that fourth Gentile kingdom, the Roman Empire, and yet he is given no details about it. In the final chapter of Daniel, chapter 12, I believe that not only is the time of trouble under Antiochus Epiphanes alluded to, this is surely coming upon his people, and perhaps the deliverance from the Maccabees that was occasioned by that attack, 
But this also might be a portion of the book that quite possibly it looks all the way to Messiah's final return and triumph over the beast kingdom of the Antichrist. So now having looked briefly at the entire book of Daniel, I want to compare, but more importantly contrast, chapters 9 and 11. Again, in chapter 9 we saw Daniel's prayer for his people. He was very concerned and this included the answer included the 70 week prophecy for his people, which uh, told of that final week being fulfilled by Messiah, I believe, and according to the historicist view. It is his death in the middle of that week which confirms the covenant of the book of Jeremiah and which brings the sacrifices to an end. Now, in contrast, in chapter 11, we see Daniel prophesying about the Greek Empire as it is divided under Alexander the Great's death and this vile person Antiochus Epiphanes rising to authority who is going to profane the temple and take away those sacrifices. Well you know that I believe looking at words more closely can really deepen our understanding so let's look at the verbs surrounded or surrounding these sacrifices. In chapter 9, we see that the sac sacrifices cease, and in chapter 11, they are taken away. So what is the difference, if indeed there is any? In chapter 11, the word used there is sur, and it means to behead, pluck away, rebel, revolt, or to put down. Whereas when we look at the sacrifices being uh, ended or ceasing, that word is Shabbat, and that means to repose or to rest, to desist from exertion, to celebrate, to Sabbath. So this really, for me, is just one of those things that helps me to believe this view is correct, this view of Daniel chapter 9. Okay, because we have chapter 9 looking to the Messiah, to his ministry and his death between 29 and 33 AD. And even though Daniel is looking forward in time as well to Antiochus Epiphanes at 16, from 167 to 156 BC, it's pretty clear that this word Shabbating the sacrifices so clearly matches Messiah's completed work on the cross, right? It, he's closed for good the sacrifices and oblation. He's rested from his work as as the Father rested in creation. Whereas here in chapter 11, it's also a pretty good match. Antiochus Epiphanes as a type of Antichrist is beheading, plucking away, rebelling, revolting, taking away the sacrifices. This is a, um, you know, a different heart altogether, very much against the sacrifices. So there you have that. So now I want to present a few sources that I believe help to confirm this view. And beginning with Albert Barnes, we read on the question of whether or not this refers to Christ. He says, the inquiry will then occur whether this refers to his birth or to his appearance as the anointed one, his taking upon himself publicly the office. The language would apply to either, says Mr. Barnes, though it would perhaps more properly refer to the latter to the time when he should appear as such, or should be anointed, crowned, or set apart to the office, and be fully instituted in it. He continues, It is remarkable, among other things, as not being a direct answer to the prayer, and as seeming to have no bearing on the subject of Daniel's petition, that the city of Jerusalem might be rebuilt and the temple restored. However, he says it directs the mind onward to another and more important event, the coming of the Messiah and the final closing of sacrifice and oblation and a more entire and enduring destruction of the temple and city after it should have been rebuilt than had yet occurred. The Messiah would appear after the 69 weeks altogether would have been finished Throughout half of the other week, the final week after his appearing, he would labor to confirm the covenant with many 
and then die a violent death by which the sacrifices would be made to cease, while the confirmation of the covenant would continue even after his death. You know, I'm simply amazed that th this view of Daniel chapter 9, the view that it is Messiah who confirms the covenant, who ceases the sacrifice, that it's not the Antichrist as purported by the futurist view. You know, being prevalent among the reformers and early Bible commentators, We've lost this history, as I've said before. We've lost this historicist view. And that's really, you know, no wonder that we don't know what time it really is on the Creator's calendar today. Now, regarding chapter 11's vile person, Mr. Barnes says the reference here is to Antiochus Epiphanes, who reigned from 175 to 163 BC. And I know these dates really vary slightly according different uh, to different resources. But the epithet, says Mr. Barnes, vile, here given him, was one which his subsequent history showed to be eminently appropriate to him in all respects as a man and as a prince. He says never were such terms better applied to a man than these to Antiochus Epiphanes. When it is said that they would pollute the sanctuary of strength, the reference is to what was done by Apollonius at the command of Antiochus to profane the temple and to put an end to the sacrifices and worship there. And as regards, they shall take away the daily sacrifice, Mr. Barnes says, that is, shall forbid it and so pollute the temple and the altar as to prevent its being offered. He says this occurred in the month of June, 167 BC. Next, Mr. Barnes is going to quote from the book of Maccabees. Um, the account is as follows, quote, Thus they shed innocent blood on every side of the sanctuary and defiled it, insomuch that the inhabitants of Jerusalem fled because of them. Wherefore, the city was made a habitation of strangers, and became strange to those who were born in her, and her own children left her. Her sanctuary was laid waste like a wilderness, and her feasts were turned into mourning, her Sabbaths into reproach, her honor into contempt. As had been her glory, so was her dishonor increased, and her excellency was turned into mourning. They said, Moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and everyone should leave his laws. So all the pagans agreed according to the commandment of the king. Yea, even many Israelites consented to his religion and sacrificed unto idols and profaned the Sabbath. For the king had sent letters by messengers unto Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, that they should follow the strange laws of the land and forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the temple, that they should profane the Sabbaths and festival days and pollute the sanctuary and holy people. They should set up altars and groves and chapels of idols and sacrifice swine's flesh and unclean beasts, that they should also leave their children uncircumcised and make their souls abominable with all manner of uncleanness and profanation, to the end that they might forget the law and change all the ordinances. And as regards the abomination that makes desolate, Mr. Barnes says, that very expression occurs in the book of First Maccabees, chapter 1, verse 54. Now the fifteenth day of the month of Kislev, in the hundred and forty-fifth year, they set up the abomination of desolation upon the altar and builded idol altars throughout the cities of Judah on every side. Mr. Barnes says this would seem to have been an idol altar erected over or upon the altar of burnt offerings. They did sacrifice upon the idol altar, which was upon the altar of God. At this time, an old man by the name of Athenius was sent to Jerusalem to instruct the Jews in the Greek religion and compel them to an observance of its rites. He dedicated the temple to Jupiter Olympius 
and on the altar of Jehovah, the account goes, he placed a smaller altar to be used in sacrificing to the pagan god. And here we see Mr. Barnes's resource listed. All right, since we've looked at some, again, some quotes, some recorded um, ideas and opinions upon these things, I want to once again look at these two chapters, really summarily comparing them again. And we remember that in Daniel chapter 9, this was the Messiah confirming the covenant, ending the sacrifices, and we saw that Titus and his Roman army destroyed the temple in 70 AD. All of this was prophesied in Daniel chapter 9. When we look at Daniel chapter 11, we saw the prophecies of Antiochus IV, who was against the covenant, who forbid the offerings, and who profanes the temple in 167 BC. And I think it's, again, interesting to look at the contrast between Messiah and a type of the Antichrist, Antiochus Epiphanes. Messiah confirms the covenant where the Antichrist was against the covenant, right? Antiochus was against the covenant. That's the wording there in Daniel 11. Messiah in chapter 9 ended the sacrifices by Shabbating them, where Antiochus forbids them. And the Romans destroyed the temple, whereas the Greeks under Antiochus certainly profaned it. So again, that's just um, interesting. Before we leave Daniel completely, I want to look get at this phrase, the abomination that causes desolation. Now, it is mentioned in Daniel chapter 9 and 11, but it's also referenced in Matthew chapter 24. So I'm going to offer up lifehopeandtruth.com in their article, What is the Abomination of Desolation? They tell us Daniel's prophecy of the abomination of desolation describes events that occurred in Jerusalem around 168 or 167 BC during the rule of the 8th Seleucid king Antiochus IV. He is better known in history as Antiochus Epiphanes, and that is Greek for manifestation of God. It's interesting that those who disliked the man refer to him as Antiochus Epimenes, and that actually uh, translates the insane one. So that gives us another view of the man. But let's look at the exact verse in chapter 11 that uses the terminology abomination that causes desolation. It begins with, and arms shall stand on his part, him being the vile person that ra is raised up, and they shall pollute the sanctuary, and they shall place the abomination that makes desolate Remember, this is Antiochus Epiphanes, the Greek ruler. Let's look at the similar phrase now that is found in chapter 9, in verse 27. And this begins with, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And then it picks up with, And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation of this war. Remember, this is the Messiah. And when we make this contrast between chapter 9 and 11, really, it couldn't be clearer that Antiochus profanes the temple by placing the abomination of desolation there in Jerusalem and in the temple. But Messiah, many years later, makes the altar desolate for the overspreading of abominations. I submit that Messiah's sacrificial atonement, ending the oblations and the offerings, basically leaving the temple vacant of the presence of God, so that the coming Gentiles can trample the holy city for 1,260 years. You know, it puts me in mind of Matthew chapter 21, where Yeshua cleared the temple of the money changers, and his zeal for the house of God. I think maybe that was a picture of what he would do on the cross. His death would clear the way for the overspreading of abominations, making the temple desolate until the end of the war. So again, we see regarding the abomination that causes desolation, Messiah clears the temple of God's presence, if you will, by Shabbating the sacrifices because abominations are coming, whereas Antiochus places something in the temple which is an abomination. 
Next, I want to look at Ray C. Stedman. We have seen his work before. The templemount.org has an article entitled The Destruction of the Temple Mount. And regarding Matthew 24 and the reference to Daniel about the abomination that causes desolation, we read in Luke chapter 21, verse 20, we have other details of this predicted overthrow of the city and the temple. He says there, Jesus adds, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know that its desolation has come near. He says, 40 years later, the Roman armies under Titus came in and fulfilled the prediction to the very letter. With Titus was a Jewish historian named Josephus who recorded the terrible story in minute detail. It was one of the most ghastly sieges in all history. Now we are going to visit Matthew chapter 24 more closely in just a moment, but this is really a sneak preview, if you will, as to why Yeshua references this book in Matthew. Remember, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, he said, you know that its desolation is near. And I believe Yeshua is referencing Daniel now because, well, the disciples are meant to connect the history of Antiochus Epiphanes with the near future fulfillment by Titus and the Romans. Now regarding this phrase in Matthew itself, and Mr. Bourne says of it, the abomination that causes desolation is a Hebrew expression, meaning an abominable or hateful destroyer. The Gentiles were all held in abomination by the Jews, according to Acts. The abomination of desolation, Mr. Barnes says, means the Roman army, and is so explained by Luke 21. We just saw that. The Roman army is further called the abomination on account of the images of the emperor and the eagles carried in front of the legions and regarded by the Romans with divine honors. Next, he says, Mark tells us, standing where it ought not, meaning the same thing. All Jerusalem was esteemed holy. The meaning of this then is when you see the Roman armies standing in the holy city or encamped around the temple or the Roman ensigns or standards in the temple, this is the abomination that causes desolation. Next, Mr. Barnes says that Josephus relates that when the city was taken, the Romans brought their idols into the temple and placed them over the eastern gate and sacrificed to them there. And finally, he adds, whosoever reads this, let him understand. This seems to be a remark made by the evangelist to direct the attention of the reader, particularly to the meaning of the prophecy by Daniel. And again, I believe it was to show that the histories were to be connected. So now it's time to go through the... 24th chapter of Matthew, very quickly, I've said this is where Jesus connects the two books of Daniel and Revelation, and I want to make the case for that statement now. But really, it begins at the end of chapter 23, where just prior to giving his discourse on the Mount of Olives, Jesus laments over Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of Yahweh. This is very important what Jesus has just told the Pharisees and his audience. Even here, he seems to be making reference to what his death on the cross is going to do in terms of ending the sacrificial system and leaving the temple desolate for the coming abominations. In fact, I believe it was this very statement that prompted his disciples to point out the temple to Jesus in the beginning verses of chapter 24. And of course, this is where Jesus prophesies of its destruction leaving not one stone left upon the other. In verses 4 through 14, 
Yeshua gives a brief overview of the coming seals, trumpets, and the bowls of the book of Revelation. I believe it's clear from his mention of the false Christs, wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. These are abundant in the book of Revelation as we have seen. Next he mentions persecution and deception. And then as if to wrap it all up nicely, he says the gospel will be, be preached in all of the world before the end. And in verses 15 through 22, Jesus says, When you see the abomination of desolation, flee to the mountains immediately. He then proceeds with sorrows for those with young children, and he tells the people to pray that it, their flight isn't in winter or on the Sabbath, because then there shall be great tribulation, and except those days be shortened, no flesh should be saved. Remember, Yeshua has just summed up the next 2,000 years, or what we call the Day of the Lord. And I can almost envision him looking over their heads as if far into the future while he's summarizing that. Only now his attention most likely was focused back on the present. Maybe he locked eyes with them at that point, And he gives this warning of what possibly is going to begin everything, the destruction of the temple in just 40 short years. This is why I think the preterist view of the book of Revelation, that view which says it was all fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, even exists. Clearly, Jesus is talking about the coming destruction of the temple at this point, but the following verses show it doesn't stop there. In verses 23 through 28, he seems to return to his overview of the book of Revelation when he mentions the many false Christs and prophets who will come, the great signs and wonders that would, might deceive the elect if that were possible. And then he tells them not to believe these liars and deceivers because when he returns, we're all going to know it. Next, Yeshua gives a very interesting phrase. He says, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. You know, and that has always perplexed many of us, but on the heels of telling us not to believe people who say here is Christ or there is Christ, I mean, you don't have to be told by anyone that there's a dead carcass lying somewhere near you, right? It's apparent by what's happening in the air above it or in the heavenlies, if you will. I think so too shall we know that our Lord has arrived because it'll be that obvious. And I think his next words, for as the lightning is, so shall the sign or so shall the coming of the Son of Man be, kind of confirms that. In the next three verses, I believe Yeshua once again looks forward in time. He begins with the words immediately following the tribulation of those days. And I do believe that he is talking about the great tribulation that is going to come in 70 AD. We talked in our last video about the great diasporic community at the time of the destruction of the temple and the Bar Kokhba revolt, that that quite possibly kept the Jewish people from being totally annihilated. And that really does fit with Yeshua's description of, you know, that great tribulation. If it weren't shortened, there'd be no life left. So he's telling us that just after that time, just after the destruction of the temple, and then he says in verse 29 alone that the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the heaven, and the heavens themselves will be shaken. Again, these are revelation events. And in the next two verses, he seems to jump forward to the very end, just after the bowl judgments. We see the sign of the Son of Man appearing, the earth mourning as Messiah comes in the clouds with the sound of the trumpet, to gather together the elect. And this is what we refer to generally as the rapture, that gathering of those who belong to Christ at his coming. In these next verses, I believe Yeshua means to put us on our guard to be watchful. And though he will tell us that not man nor angel know the day or the hour, only the Father, we will know or we should know the season. 
And then his ever mysterious, this generation shall not pass until all be fulfilled, leaving pretty much everyone confused about who's going to see these things come to pass. You'll notice that I used the word age instead of generation because it can be and has been interpreted uh, that way as well. In fact, the Greek word is genia, meaning generation, age, nation, or even time. Now there's no denying that generation is usually the best interpretation, but my point is there's some wiggle room. You know, it's quite possible that Yeshua is simply saying, hey, we're not getting out of here until everything I say happens. This age, this time, you know, things aren't over until everything's been fulfilled. That's just really quite possible. I'm sure his disciples' heads are swimming at this point and he, he really needs to kind of wake them from their stupor. But there are other views as well. And since he began with what's going to kick off the next 2,000 years, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, that great tribulation, um, it's quite possible that he's just speaking to you know, his disciples and, and those standing there in front of him, right? Because at the very least, this is going to occur during their lifetime, which of course is exactly what happened. And yet there are other ideas. The fact that he begins with this parable of the fig tree telling us that we should know the season when we see the, it putting forth its green leaves and Israel being associated with the fig tree throughout the scriptures. Many think that Israel coming back into the land, right? Being planted back in the promised land its leaves beginning to put, you know, putting forth these shoots, um, that this is the generation who will see all of these things come to pass in the terms of the larger picture. And certainly from, you know, according to the historicist view, we have all of this history behind us. We're at the, at the very end. Israel's in the land. These things have, you know, practically all been fulfilled. That's quite uh, another, pro you know, possibility of what is being said here. So time will tell for a lot of this, won't it? In the final 16 verses of chapter 24, Jesus lets us know that most people will be taken off guard, not knowing the day or the hour and not even knowing the season. He explains that just like in the days of Noah, when the flood, quote unquote, took away mankind, um, it's going to be the same way in the end of days. So watch. He says, if we're watchful, we won't be surprised. Things won't be stolen or taken away. You know, I can't help but feel that Jesus's words here apply to the mistaken view of the book of Revelation, the futurist view. It, that, of course, purports that you don't want to be left behind. You want to be taken. But, um, you know, we're given some examples in this chapter that... Two shall be in the field. One will be taken, the other will be left. And then another example, two women shall be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other will be left. And on the heels of comparing this being taken away to the flood, it's very clear, according to the Bible commentators, if you look those up, that the idea was, you know, those who didn't pay attention, who didn't get on board the ark, were taken away. That wasn't a good thing. The flood took them away. And likewise, when one is left and one is taken, it begs the question, do you want to be taken? Is that really the picture we should be getting? And, you know, we've talked about the parable of the weeds, the wheat and the tares. And in Matthew 13, Yeshua said, let them grow together until the harvest time. And in the harvest time, I'm going to say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to be burned. So again, um, you know, that's just an afterthought. It's speculation, but the picture is pretty clear. And then again, he just tells us to be watchful, be faithful until the end. And so that is the challenge. Really, what we have to remember is that the entire chapter is a response to two questions asked by the disciples. The first one, when shall these things be? And the second question, what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Well, we have seen that 
the answer to his first question was the coming tribulation, the great tribulation in 70 AD, the destruction of the temple, which is going to kick things off, if you will. The second question really could be divided into two questions. What is the sign of your coming? And when will the end of the world occur? And you might be surprised to learn that God's people had been expecting the Messiah to come and establish a new heaven and a new earth for quite some time. You know, I don't believe the disciples had in view his second advent, what you and I call his return. Remember, they didn't even understand when he explained that he would die and be resurrected. They were pretty clueless. Perhaps they were merely asking when he would take up his throne and rule and when would their current situation end? You know, we need a sense of what was in view here and preceptaustin.org, quoting the noted Bible scholar, John Woolvard, tells us in their articles entitled The Last Days uh, about the perspective we really are lacking. They say the Bible uses the phrases the last days and the last times with reference to several different time periods. Since the coming of God's promised Messiah is identified with the last days, there is a sense in which they began with the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Broadly speaking, therefore, the last days include the earthly life and ministry of Jesus Christ, the entire history of the church to the present, as well as all events prophesied in the scriptures that are still unfulfilled. Now, this article and Mr. Walvoord do indeed take a futurist view of Revelation, but I include their remarks here because they're spot on about what the Jews expected when the Messiah was to come. And I'm going to take some liberty in this next excerpt by highlighting in red the areas that really reveal their futurist perspective, but I'm going to read it with a historicist view by omitting those highlights. In the Old Testament, the last days are identified with God's blessings of restoration and salvation for his chosen people, Israel. God poured out his spirit on the people of Israel and saved them. I believe that occurred, remember, at the sealing of the 144,000 early on in the book of Revelation. The people of Israel returned to the Lord at that time, and God restored them to the promised land. I believe that began in 1948 and is continuing to be fulfilled as Jews continue to make Aliyah. The fact that Jerusalem will become the capital of all nations, I do believe that is yet future. Perhaps in the millennial kingdom we will see that come to pass. So it could be said that in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is highlighting the last days that his Jewish disciples would have been familiar with. Of course, with the exception of his death and resurrection. They did not expect that. In conclusion, they ask, when will one stone not be left upon another? And he answers, when the Romans, like Antiochus, surround Jerusalem. Next, they ask, when will the sign of your coming or the last days be? And his answer was, boys, I'm already here. And finally, when will be the end of the world or the end of things as we have known them? And he says the end is not yet. A lot has to happen. Hang on. In fact, he probably really wanted to tell them that he's going to reveal that answer to John. Maybe he was thinking about that walking along the beach with Peter when Peter was asking, what's going to happen to him? And uh, Yeshua said, you know, he, he's going to hang around a while. I need to talk with him. That is just a good note to end on. Our historicist extra, our Revelation extra, The Books of a Feather, showed us that Daniel gives the histories of the first three Gentile kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Persia, and Grisha. And that Matthew, not only will Matthew record the fulfilling of Daniel's 70th week of chapter 9 by recording Messiah's death, resurrection, and the new covenant in his blood, Yeshua is also going to uh, look back at Daniel in chapter 11 when he tells about the coming destruction of the temple. He mentions no names, of course, but history is going to bear out that just like Antiochus Epiphanes, 
Titus and the Romans are going to pave the way for coming abominations. And finally, in the book of Revelation, Jesus unfolds the history of the Roman Empire, that fourth Gentile kingdom, and its reincarnated image. Thank you for joining me today. I hope that this has been helpful. Next time, when I see you on the Book of Revelation Historicist View, we're going to demystify a sea monster. Until then, stay well, keep studying, and shalom.